Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 6J of Useful Genetics, where we're going to talk about two particular kinds of ancestry analysis using mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA. And these two forms of analysis trace two different kinds of and very specific subsets of our ancestry, the maternal lineage and the paternal lineage. And they miss most of our ancestors, but they have been very powerful for other kinds of information. So here's our family tree. And now I'm going to concentrate on these two particular lineages, the paternal lineage, which is the line going back from you to your, if you're male, from you to your father, your father's father, your great grandfather, all the way back just with the male ancestry. In the other side, we can follow your maternal ancestry all the way back through your mother's 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 mother. And we're able to follow these particular lineages because of two particular kinds of DNA that have very special properties. And the first is the Y chromosome. Now, the Y chromosome, as we learned, carries the SRY gene that determines male development. Now that means that the Y chromosome is, we say it's inherited only by sons, but really everybody who gets a Y chromosome becomes a son. And that means everybody who gets a Y chromosome can become a father, but not a mother. That's why the Y chromosome DNA can be traced back. The Y chromosome that you got from your father, he got from his father, and your paternal grandfather got it from his father, and so on all the way back. So looking at DNA sequences on the Y chromosome, and this uses the same kinds of DNA sequences that are analysis that's used for DNA fingerprinting usually, gives you a trace of your ancestry in the male line. Now, the other kind of ancestry is traced through what's called mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria are small um, cellular structures called organelles present in all of our cells. And what's unique about these little structures is that they each have their own DNA molecule. And when the organelle divides, just like a little cell, because they're actually originally descended from bacteria, these descendants of the little organelle also get their own mitochondrial DNA. And when the cell divides, to, whoops, back. When the cell divides to give you two daughter cells, each daughter cell, in addition to inheriting the nucleus, inherits mitochondria, each with their own mitochondrial DNA. Now there's one exception. I said that all cells have mitochondria. That's not quite true. One kind of cells, well it has mitochondria, but it can't pass them on, and that's the sperm. So sperm have a bundle of energy generating mitochondria. That's the mitochondria. Its function is to generate energy for the cell. Sperm need lots of energy to swim and they have a mitochondrion to generate their swimming energy. But this mitochondrion doesn't get passed on when the sperm fertilizes an egg. So the sperm nucleus joins with the egg nucleus but the sperm mitochondria don't enter the cell. The egg only contains the maternally derived mitochondria with the maternally derived mitochondrial DNA. And this means that although we all have mitochondria, we all got them from our mothers, who got them from their mother, from their mother, all the way back. So by looking at sequence similarities in mitochondrial DNA, we can trace um, and our ancestry and detect relatives who share similar sequences. Now, here's the kind of report that you get from 23andMe about mitochondrial and Y chromosome 
relatives who share mitochondrial or Y chromosome sequences. And these similarities are expressed in terms of haplogroups. Now, the sensible response to hearing this word is to say, wait, I don't know what a haplogroup is. We did learn about haplotypes way back, I think, in module one. What's a haplogroup? So first, I'll remind you what a haplotype is. So back to our tree, our diagram of ancestry. Consider an ancestor many generations back. This is only five, but it could be many more generations back. And consider a particular DNA sequence in that ancestry. It doesn't have to be mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosome DNA. It could be any part of the autosomes. And I've indicated in this sequence certain bases in red to represent places where that individual's DNA sequence differed from the DNA sequences of other people alive at the same time. And we can summarize those differences and call that a haplotype, the haplotype of this ancestor for this sequence. Usually when we represent haplotypes, we leave out all the bases that are the same in everybody and only show the bases that are distinctive. Now, this person would have left many descendants. And if we look at the same DNA sequence in their descendants and ask what haplotype they have, what we'll find is that they all inherited this haplotype from this ancestor, but that there have been a few changes along the way. A few mutations have crept in in some of the individuals. But all the other bases of the haplotype remain the same, and it's easy to recognize that all of these individuals share related haplotypes, and those related haplotypes, that set, is called a haplogroup. So back to our diagram, now just thinking about the maternal lineage. So what DNA ancestry analysis can do. It can't compare your DNA to your ancestors, well, maybe to your parents and your grandparents if they're still alive, but not farther back. But it can compare the DNA of relatives, you and other people who might be your relative, to ask, what are the similarities? When similarities in mitochondrial DNA are reported, here's the report from 23andMe, and you see I've circled the mitochondrial haplogroups that each of these individuals has been assigned to based on their sequence. And you can see that these people, in fact, this is me, my mother, my daughter, and a distant cousin all share the H5 haplogroup. This is absolutely expected that I have the same haplogroup as my mother, she's who I got it from, and that my daughter has the same haplotype as me. My father, however, has a different haplogroup, and that's because he got it from his mother. And here's another cousin with yet another haplogroup. Now, if we think about Y chromosome DNA, this story is very similar. Again, we can't sequence ancestors, but we can compare living individuals. And now we see that my father shares a Y chromosome haplogroup with someone who's predicted to be a third or fourth cousin. He doesn't share a haplogroup with another cousin. Now, the mitochondrial and Y chromosome assays are very powerful because they're not broken up by recombination, we can use them to track lineages very precisely. But they only tell you about one lineage in all of your ancestry. And that's problems illustrated on the next slide. Again, here's our diagram. Here's the maternal lineage, mother to mother, grandmother to great grandmother. Here's the paternal lineage. So you got your Y chromosome, if you're male, from this person. You got your mitochondria from this person. But almost all of your autosomal DNA came from other individuals. These two individuals contributed 
only about 0.1% of your autosomal and X chromosome DNA, just a tiny fraction. All the rest came from all these other relatives that aren't detected by the Y chromosome and um, mitochondrial DNA analysis. And that's why now more and more people are opting for the full um, SNP typing autosomal analysis instead. It's not that much more expensive. Now, yes, in Module 7, once we've talked about inheritance, we'll be able to consider ancestry in more detail, so I hope you'll stick around for that. Now, I said that um, Y chromosomes and mitochondria were very powerful tools for investigating deeper evolutionary history because they're not broken up by recombination like the autosomal genes are, as we'll learn more about in Module 7. So, Here's a diagram that I showed you back in Module 1, showing the pattern of human migrations. This was what's called the Out of Africa model for human evolution. And this model was derived based on genetic evidence, based on analysis of mitochondrial DNA sequences. And the next slide shows the human migrations as evidenced by the kinds of mitochondrial haplogroups that are present around the world. So we see a number of haplogroups that are uniquely African haplogroups. These would be the African groups that didn't migrate out of Africa. We see others that spread through southern Asia, that spread into Europe, one haplogroup that spread into northern Europe then spread across the Bering land bridge when sea levels were lower during the last glaciation, along with haplogroups from northern Asia, and one haplogroup that was only known for southern Asia. And these are the haplogroups that are found in all of North America and South America. That's how we knew that the peoples of North and South America got there from Asia and not, for example, by migration from Europe. So what we've done, we've talked about how mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA are inherited through the strictly maternal line and the strictly paternal line, respectively. And we've introduced a new term, that of haplogroup, which I think you'll see more of, certainly if you're thinking about ancestry. I'm not sure how much more we're going to talk about haplogroups in this course. We talked about how mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA miss most of our ancestry. We also talked about how they're very powerful tools for examining human evolutionary history. Coming up next, we're going to think about a different kind of analysis, sequencing both the exome, and we'll define what that is, or the whole genome to find out information about your genotype and your predicted phenotype. I hope to see you there.